Jesus actually says uh, a few things here about prayer. Uh, he gives to us a, a summary of uh, the Lord's Prayer uh, in answer to a, a disciple's question, and we'll see why that question perhaps arose. Uh, so a pattern for prayer, an abbreviated pattern. Then he gives to us an encouragement to be persistent in prayer and then tells us why um, the Lord will actually answer our prayers. Um, so rather than deal with these things separately, I thought it would be good just to get the whole thing out together and that we might be encouraged to put this into practice. Uh, if we really want to see uh, things happen in our day for the glory of God, we really do need to ask for these things and continue to ask uh, until the Lord uh, answers. So let's begin by reading what Jesus has to say and then we'll take a look at this. So first of all, beginning in chapter 11, verse 1, let me read uh, the first 13 verses. It happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Then he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers and says, do not bother me. The door has already been shut and my children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. He will not give him a snake instead of a fish, will he? Or if he is asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, I think you can see there's a lot here, but uh, we're going to uh, seek to cover all of this. And I think we're familiar enough with this to just be able to uh, review and uh, get the main points enough to be able to put it into practice. Now, this morning, uh, we saw, first of all, the priority that Jesus wants us to put on sitting at his feet as his disciples and learning his ways. Uh, there are many good things that uh, we can do, even good things for the glory of God, things uh, that might help those who are working to build up the kingdom of heaven, even as Martha was doing a very good thing this morning as we saw her preparing to show hospitality and provide the needs of Jesus and his disciples. But Jesus pointed out the most important thing we can do is spend time with him, which is what Mary was doing, listening to his word learning what he wants us to be and what he would have us do. Remember what our Lord Jesus Christ uh, says in Matthew 11, verses 29 through 30. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. This is essentially what Mary was doing. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Martha was very anxious with all of her busyness trying to meet all of these needs and Mary was experiencing the peace of the Lord at his feet because she had taken his yoke. And then Jesus reminds us his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Now, not everything we have to do for the Lord is necessarily going to be easy, but the Lord will make it so because of the love he gives to us and the desire to glorify the Lord. The joy will outweigh any of the difficulties that we have to face. But spending time with Jesus is really more than just listening to what Jesus has to say, although that's the most important thing. It's also speaking to him, isn't it? 
It's praying and seeking Him. Uh, he speaks to us today through, through His Word, which is essentially what He's doing right now, isn't He? He's communicating to us from the Word of God. And of course, as we spend time in the Word and as we read the Word, as we study the Word, but He also wants us to speak to Him in prayer and to ask for certain things because this is the way the kingdom of heaven moves forward. This is the way that our needs are actually met. This is the way the Lord has planned that he would do what he does in this world. So Jesus now turns to this topic uh, providentially in um, answer to a disciple's question. And this evening what I'd like us to consider are, are three things. Uh, the right pattern of prayer and in this abbreviation of the Lord's Prayer, the need of persistence in prayer, which we see in that parable, and then the certainty of answered prayer because of God's fatherly goodness. Now, first of all, we see the right pattern of prayer. Luke tells us that after Jesus finished praying in a certain place, which very well could have been the Mount of Olives. Remember the last we heard, he was in Bethany and, you know, at Martha and Mary and Lazarus' house, and we know that when he was there, he would often go to the Mount of Olives to pray. That's what he'll do in the last week of his life as he goes out of the city, spending time in Bethany, spending time at the Mount of Olives. Well, after he had finished praying, one of his disciples came to him with a request in verse 1, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. Now, this is kind of an interesting question, isn't it? Um, and I've already mentioned that um, you know, Luke's gospel may not necessarily be following a strict chronology. He gathered all this information by interviewing eyewitnesses. Uh, and it seems like this might be out, out of place from what we see in Matthew's gospel because the Lord's Prayer is a part of the Sermon on the Mount. So we might ask the question, since Jesus had already taught his disciples how to pray and already given them a pattern in that sermon, why is this disciple asking him to do this again? Well, it's likely because um, this particular disciple wasn't there at the time Jesus said that, but was somebody who followed Jesus later. I think we assume whenever we read a disciple, it's going to be one of the 12, but Jesus had many more disciples than just them. This particular disciple was familiar with John's ministry, wasn't he? He had, uh, had knew that John the Baptist had taught his disciples, but he wanted to hear Jesus and what he had to say about prayer and apparently had not heard the sermon. And so Jesus, very wisely and as a good teacher, teaches not just that disciple, but all his disciples again. Now, a good teacher realizes that those who hear him aren't going to be able to remember everything he says after just one hearing. The lesson needs to be repeated again and again and again. Just look at the Old Testament and look at the repetition in the Old Testament. Why is it there? Well, it's because we're not going to get it the first time, right? We should never assume that we've learned anything just because we've heard it one time, especially as we get older. You know, our short-term memories tend to go, as we were talking about this morning, uh, or this afternoon at lunch, we can very easily forget what we hear, but that's true of, of young folks as well and, and young believers. And even recognizing that we've heard something before, you know, we hear it again and we recognize, oh, I've heard that before. It doesn't mean that we've actually learned it. It only means we can recognize it when we hear it. Uh, we can't really assume that we've learned something, I think, until we are able to share that truth with other people. And I think when we can successfully do that, we really have learned it. But even after that, we need to hear it again, don't we? So that we can be reminded there is so much truth that we need to be reminded over and over and over again. So Jesus, again, speaks to all his disciples to remind them how he wants them to pray. So how does Jesus want his disciples to pray? And how does he want us to pray? Well, he tells us in verses two through four, he says, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Now, I've already mentioned this 
is really an abbreviation of what Jesus taught earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. But notice, if, if you remember that sermon, it contains all the same parts and in the same order that it's in the sermon. First of all, he tells us that we are to address our prayers to the Father. And by the way, the fact that it's in the same order, I think, tells us that Jesus has an interest in having us lay out our prayers in this way. So first of all, we are to address our prayers to the Father. Now, we know from the rest of the scriptures that we may also pray to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, since all three persons are God. Sometimes the word Father doesn't refer just to the Father. Sometimes the word Father refers to the Godhead, refers to God, refers to the three persons. Uh, think about this. When we, when we read, in, uh, well, read about the scenes in heaven, and we read about the one sitting on the throne, and then Jesus sitting at his right hand, okay? Uh, where's the Holy Spirit? Where's, you know, where's the divine nature of our Lord Jesus Christ? Now, how is that represented? Well, I think it's represented by the one sitting on the throne. It's, it's not just the Father, but it is the triune God. And Jesus sitting at his right hand is, of course, uh, you know, the man, Christ Jesus, who is God and man. While Jesus was on earth, his divine nature was certainly everywhere, certainly was in heaven. Uh, and now that he's in heaven, uh, his divine nature, of course, is in heaven as well as his human nature. I realize that can get a little bit confusing, but the idea here is... Jesus may simply be telling us here that when we address the Father, we should address our prayers to the Godhead, or he may be emphasizing our relationship with God. God is our Father, and we are his children. And as children come to their Father, as we're going to see in this example at the end of this particular section, uh, come to their Father and, and know they're going to be received and know that they're going to receive what they need when they ask their Father, so we are to come to God and ask Him as our Father to give us the things we need. So first of all, we are to pray to the Father. Secondly, He tells us that we are to pray that God would be reverenced. Hallowed be your name. Now, to hallow means to regard as holy, to reverence. And praying that his name be treated in this way, hallowed be your name, uh, is praying that, that God would be treated in this way, that he would be reverenced, that he would be treated as holy because his name is, is a designation of him. You know, if I'm talking about one of you and I use your name, I'm talking about you, right? I'm not talking about your name. Well, the same thing is true here. Hallowed be your name means may you, God, be hallowed. Jesus wants us to pray here, first of all, that God would be worshipped, that he would be praised, that he would be adored, treated as he should be treated, not just by us, but by the whole world, because he is worthy. So addressing the Father and praying that he would be worshipped and adored. Now the third petition, or I should say it's not really the third petition, because the first is really just an address, so the second petition is how the first is actually going to be accomplished. Your kingdom come, which means your kingdom appear, your kingdom progress, your kingdom fill the world, even as it's predicted in the Old Testament that it will. Now, we know that his kingdom already existed. You know, it existed as early as Adam and Eve, right? They were the first subjects uh, of, of the king, and even after their fall and their redemption. We know the kingdom existed in Israel in the Old Covenant and that it was growing. You know, it, Abraham's family, uh, basically at that time, it was limited to his family and, and those who would come into the family, uh, trusting in the, the covenant God of Israel. But it was growing very, very slowly. But since Jesus has come, and especially after he's given the Great Commission to make disciples of all the nations, it has been growing uh, faster. It's, it's gone quite a long way since the time it was limited just to Israel. Well, Jesus wants us to pray that his kingdom would continue to grow, continue to progress through the preaching of the gospel until all have heard. And as he says in the, the, you know, the fuller version, until his will is done 
on earth as it is in heaven. And I think you can see that these first two petitions, hallowed be your name and your kingdom come, really have to do with the work of evangelism and missions. Our Lord is telling us that we need to put those first. That's putting the kingdom first. And after we put the kingdom first in our prayers, then we are to pray for the things that we need. Uh, the third petition is give us this day our daily bread. The Lord wants us to learn to look to him every single day for the needs of every day, even if those needs already seem to be met. We still need to ask for food, for shelter, for clothing, for health, for safety. All the things we take for granted, where do those gifts come from? They come from, you know, the one uh, above from whom all good gifts come, the one with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Every good thing bestowed comes down from God. And we need to look to him and acknowledge that these things come from him and remember to depend on him every single day for the things we need. And by the way, that gives us this day our daily bread encompasses all of our physical needs. Next, we are to pray for forgiveness and forgive us our sins. You know, it's true that, that the Bible tells us that if we are walking with the Lord in the light, which means we're trusting Jesus and we're living according to his word, John tells us in the first letter that he is continually cleansing us from all of our sins. But it's also true in the next verses, actually, in, in 1 John chapter 1, that he wants us to confess our sins to him daily. As a matter of fact, when we become aware of our sins, he says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, again, if we're walking with the Lord, he's continually cleansing us, which means that if we happen to die before we confess a sin, you know, our sins are still forgiven and we're going to go to heaven, but our Lord wants us continually to confess our sins at the same time, if we're not having, you know, dying on that particular moment, we need to confess our sins. And I think he wants us to do that so that we'll be more aware of what we're doing, right? Aware that we've sinned against him. And confessing our sins encourages us, I think, to not only be aware of them, but to turn away from them. Turn away from specific sins and turn into the path of righteousness that we might walk more closely with him. So we are to pray that the Lord would forgive us of our sins. But we don't want to miss the second part of this particular petition. And that is Jesus tells us we may only expect that our sins are forgiven if we are forgiving other people. Uh, Jesus says in verse 4, for, you know, uh, forgive us our sins for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, not monetarily necessarily, but, you know, who has sinned against us and is indebted to us re regarding justice, you know, that we're willing to forgive them. The evidence that we have received God's mercy is our willingness to extend mercy towards other people. Remember what James writes in James chapter 2, verse 13. For judgment, that is the judgment the Lord will mete out on us, will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Okay, if we don't show mercy, God will not show us mercy. And the reason being is because if he has shown us mercy, we will show mercy. It is the evidence that we actually do belong to him. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And again, I would point to the example of our Lord Jesus Christ who after being uh, mocked, ridiculed, abused, and beaten mercilessly and nailed to a cross, prayed for those who did that and said, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now finally, Jesus tells us to pray and lead us not into temptation. Now, we know uh, what the Bible says about this, that God never tempts us to sin. I mean, it almost sounds like Jesus is telling us here to pray that the Father would not tempt us to sin, but that's not what he's saying. He says, lead us not into temptation. 
And we need to understand this in a way that does not make God leading us into sin. Because listen to what James writes in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. God does not tempt anyone to sin, okay? So that can't mean that. But we do understand this. God does allow certain things in our lives to come into our lives in order to test us, to show us what we're like, to teach us valuable lessons, to strengthen us against sin. And the things that he brings into our lives can possibly tempt us to sin. Now, the Lord doesn't bring trials into our lives because he wants to tempt us to sin, right? But he brings the trials into our lives to strengthen us against sin. Let me just ask you if you've ever experienced this, right? You pray for the grace to overcome particular temptation. And when you pray for that, what happens? Do you find that when you're faced with a temptation, you know, that, that you have the strength to overcome it? What usually happens is the Lord will begin to subject you to that temptation over and over again until you learn to overcome it in His grace and strength. But He's not subjecting it, you to it so that you will sin, but so that you'll learn to overcome that sin, okay? That's the difference between His tempting us to sin or trying or testing us to make us stronger. Now, the other thing we need to realize is this, that, that as the Lord does this and we become stronger, then he's going to send uh, stronger trials, right? So that we might grow even more. Um, you know, our brother Jonathan Merica, every once in a while will we'll post on his Facebook. I don't know if you're friends with Jonathan Merica, but yes, you should send him a friend request just for this, if, if for no other reason. And one of these lately was, I think, very uh, appropriate for, uh, for this particular sermon. And it's a, a quote by Spurgeon uh, regarding the trial that God put him under, uh, put Abraham under, when he called him to offer his son Isaac. Now, remember, you know, he's, he says, offer up your son. Now, that's a test, but it could also end in sin, right? He could refuse to do it. So that possibility is there. So it's a trial that is meant to get him to do the right thing and to overcome you know, weaknesses that might prevent him. So this is what Spurgeon writes about this. Very insightful. First of all, the verse he's dealing with, and it came about after these things that God tested Abraham. This is what Spurgeon said. God does not put heavy burdens on weak shoulders. God educates and tests our faith by trials that increase in proportion to our faith. Therefore, beloved, expect your trials to multiply as you proceed towards heaven. Do not think that as you grow in grace, your path will become smoother and the sky calmer and clearer. Quite the contrary. As God gives you greater skill as a soldier of the cross, he will send you on more difficult missions. As he more fully equips your ship to sail in storms, he will send you on longer voyages to more boisterous seas so that you may honor him and increase in holy confidence. You would think that at Abraham's old age, after he had come to the land of Beulah, uh, not that he literally came to Beulah, this is, I think, a reference to uh, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, after the birth of Isaac, right? He had gone through the trial. Am I going to have a child? You know, he was 100 years old and so forth. You would think after all of that, and especially after the expulsion of Ishmael, he would have had a time of rest. But it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. Let Abraham's story warn us to never plan on a rest from trials this side of the grave. The trumpet will play, uh, still plays the notes of war. You cannot sit down and put, put the victory wreath on your head. You do not have a crown. You must still wear the helmet and carry the sword. You must watch, pray, and fight. Expect your last battle to be the most difficult, 
for the enemy's fiercest charge is reserved for the end of the day. I think there's a lot of wisdom in this. By the way, I just also noticed as I was reading through at this time that um, there was a little bit of time between the birth of Isaac and this trial. So there was a little bit of time in Beulah Land. It's not that the Lord is going to continually overwhelm us, but those trials do become more intense as we grow in, in grace. But as I said before, where there is a trial, and the Lord will send trials, there is the possibility of failure, the possibility of sin. Jesus teaches us to pray, first of all, that we would not be tempted by the trial to sin, and that if we are, that we might have the strength to overcome it, okay? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, one thing that's interesting here is notice the pattern that Jesus gives us is different than the pattern we usually think of when we come to pray. You know, what, what is the, the acronym, you know, that we use when we pray? Acts, right? Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Now, the adoration is certainly in the right place, right? Uh, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. But then confession. Confession comes actually after the petitions for the advancement of God's kingdom. And then what about thanksgiving? Well, thanksgiving is to be mixed in, I think, with all of our prayers, isn't it? It's continually uh, through there. We thank the Lord for what he has done in advancing the kingdom, right? As we ask for him to continue to advance it, we thank him for the blessings he's given to us. We thank him for forgiveness. We thank, well, actually, for our daily bread. We thank him for the forgiveness that we've experienced. So that's mixed into all of these things. Uh, so this acronym may not necessarily be the most accurate. I think it would be wise for us to follow the example that Jesus gives us in this particular prayer pattern. Now, secondly, uh, as I've said, there's, there's a few things wrapped up in here. Uh, after the pattern, Jesus then tells us to pray persistently, right? Not just to settle for asking once, but to continue to ask until the Lord answers. He says in verses 5 through 8, Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and goes to him at midnight, and says to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers and says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut. My children and I are in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Now, I think the point is, is fairly clear, and we really don't need much explanation here. But this, the point is essentially this. A friend might not give his friend something he needs if it's too inconvenient. Okay, this guy was already in bed with his children. Doors are shut. We're all ready for the night. It's too inconvenient. Nobody likes to be put out, right? But we should note here that our Lord wants us to be ready, contrary to this uh, example, to be ready to serve even when it is inconvenient, whenever the need arises. But notice, even though he won't give his friend what he needs because he is his friend, he will give him what he needs if he persists in, you know, persist in, in bothering him or if his bothering him becomes even more inconvenient than the inconvenience of getting up and giving him what he wants, right? So it's a greater inconvenience that he's trying to overcome. He gets up and he gives him what he needs. Now, our Lord is telling us that our Father is not like that, but he does tell us persist. Persist in prayer until the Father answers. And the reason why he, he will is, is really wrapped up in the last statement that Jesus makes. But... The last point is this, that if we persist, the Lord will certainly answer our prayers. Jesus says in verses 9 through 10, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. Now, it's not you know, immediately apparent as we read the English translation, but the tense in the Greek indicates that Jesus is saying we should do these things continuously. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. 
knock and keep on knocking. That's what it means to be persistent, right? Now, if we will do this, he says, you will receive, you will find, and the door will be opened to you. And again, the question is why? Is it because God is reluctant to be inconvenienced, and if we are, you know, make things even more inconvenient for him, that he will finally get up and give us what we need? No, that's, that's not what Jesus is saying. He will do it because he's better than that, okay, because he's good. And listen to what Jesus says in closing, verses 11 through 13. Now, suppose one of you fathers is asked by his son for a fish. You know, again, back to the family uh, relationship here. Uh, our father, you know, who is in heaven. Suppose one of you fathers is asked by a son for a fish. He will not give him a steak instead of a fish, will he? Or if he has asked for an egg, he will not give him a scorpion, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, and again, think about uh, if you won't even get up and help your friend was in, when, if he's in need unless he makes it inconvenient for you, okay? If, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You know, we give our children what they need. When they ask us for good things, we don't give them bad things, right? We don't give them harmful things. We give them what they need. And compared to God, we're evil. You know, that's what our hearts are like. Only by the grace of God are we, is there any good in us at all? But, but we'll do good things for our children. Well, if that's true of us, how much more is it true of our Heavenly Father who is gracious and who is good? Now, Jesus said this same thing on the Sermon on the Mount, only there, instead of the Holy Spirit, He says the Father will give what is good. Uh, Jonathan Edwards believed that that's really the same thing, the Holy Spirit and what is good. There's really nothing the Lord that can give that is better okay, than the Holy Spirit. That's the greatest gift, isn't it? I mean, the Holy Spirit gives us life. The Holy Spirit gives us love for God. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to serve the Lord. He is the most precious gift that we can receive from the Lord. So I think the point is, is this, that if the Lord is willing to give to us because He's so good and gracious as our Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit, then how much more will He give us everything else that we need? Okay, He will give us all these things. And so we need to do what our Lord tells us to do here. We need to pray in the way Jesus tells us to pray. Put God first, that He be adored, that He be obeyed. And then our need second, that He would forgive us and that He would provide for us and that He would help us to grow spiritually. And we need to learn to pray persistently, continuously, uh, until the Lord answers us knowing that the Lord will answer us because He is good. Now, again, let's remember what this means. That means that we can ask, as Jesus told us, for everything, anything that we need in His name, and He will give it to us. There's a lot of things that we need. So let's seek the Lord for these, uh, for these mercies. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in prayer, shall we, and ask the Lord for His uh, grace to do this.